Okay, tonight's talk is going to be about passion, compassion. <laughs> because I was just thinking when I was uh, meditating, what can I give a talk on this evening? And when I started saying, be kind towards your breath, be kind towards your body, I thought, hey, that's a really nice uh, topic for this evening's talk about compassion. But also because I had been talking a lot about tsunamis and Many of you have uh, been swamped with talk about tsunamis. One comment which I did read, which I thought was very pertinent, is that we still think that we should do something. When there's so many people still suffering, we think, well, what can we do to help? I know last weekend we had this big fundraising, which I'm sure our president will talk about at the announcements, but one thing which we can do is not just to give funds, but actually to develop more compassion in our world. And that's actually something very, very positive we can do as a result of people's suffering. So compassion is the result of suffering in the world. And we, only, we can only learn exactly what compassion is and how to develop it and where to develop it on. And I think we can build a much more wonderful world. So tonight's talk will be on the Buddhist idea of compassion. I know that uh, if you read books rather than actually come to see the reality, and books aren't real sometimes, they just miss the point too often. If you read books sometimes you hear that Theravada is the selfish part of Buddhism and Mahayana is the compassionate part of Buddhism and I'm supposed to be a monk who's just concerned about his own enlightenment and doesn't go around helping anybody at all. That's a theory, but as you know... <laughs> I work my backside off, as they say. I was going to say something else, but this is on tape. I work incredibly hard helping and serving other people, but you know it's also for myself as well. That I have found in my monastic life that when you're compassionate to others, that's the best way of being compassionate to yourself. When you're compassionate to yourself, that's the best way of being compassionate to others. And the compassion just goes both ways. And so that, that old idea of there's two types of Buddhism, those who put off their enlightenment to help other people and those who put off other people to help their own enlightenment, is just there's no difference between those two. It's very easy to see in theory, yeah, maybe makes sense, but in practice there's no difference whatsoever at all in any which way. And you can see that by example, by the monks and the nuns, the sisters at uh, Dhammasara, just to see how much we give to the world and how much we get for ourselves as well. And so when we're talking about compassion, it is a, just a unified process, which is part of not just Buddhism, but at the spiritual path. Unfortunately, sometimes we can misunderstand compassion. Sometimes people are so busy being compassionate, they argue with other people for getting in their way while they're trying to be compassionate. Get out of the way, stop disturbing me, I'm doing my meta meditation. And of course you understand they're missing the point of what compassion truly is. So even that uh, in our life we develop compassion in many ways, but it's important to develop that compassion towards oneself, or even more towards oneself, compassion to the moment. It's important as a starting block. Because compassion, like every other quality, has to be developed. We can't just say, right, now I'm going to be compassionate and think that we can just do it. Sometimes people think that the spiritual path is so easy, they just need to come to a temple to learn meditation one afternoon and they can become enlightened uh, by the next week. The, the point is that like any other quality in the mind, it takes years to develop it. It's a training. It's a development of the mind and of the heart. But sometimes people get frustrated to say, how can we actually be compassionate? We all realize that love, compassion, kindness is what makes the world a happy place, a smiley place. But sometimes, why are there just so m many miserable people around? Why is it just, some people are just so negative? Why is it that it seems that they just, their whole life is about making other people unhappy? You know, if they want to be unhappy themselves, fine, but why to make me miserable as well? But the point is that when we understand what compassion truly is, we understand that sometimes the compassion is going in the wrong way. Too often we try and sort of, uh, you can see just the way that some politicians work, we try and sort of wage wars actually for compassion, to have a battle so people can be free, to actually to have a war to liberate people. You see sometimes it's some 
cosmic wrong there, war or liberation, the two are just opposition, opposites of each other. But when we understand what compassion truly is, not as a theory, but as something we can feel in our own heart because we're practicing compassion, we know what it is, we get a feeling for it, then we're on the path to the compassionate lifestyle. And you find that if it's real true compassion, it always works, it's very powerful because Usually what people keep on asking me, they say, oh, it's okay being compassionate as a monk, but in the real world, compassion doesn't work. I was in Java just a week ago, just how busy I am, just um, going around uh, uh, Indonesia giving Dhamma talks. And what I was there, that uh, one of the questions, was a businessman was asking me, he said, look, I've got to get angry at my workers, that's the only way that I can get any work out of them. If I don't tell them off, they'll get too lazy. And I sort of argued with him and said, no, that's not the way to get the best out of your workers. Compassion will get much more work out of them. Because what happens if you're angry and if you're, uh, you're um, aggressive and you shout at people, yeah, they will work when you're there, but as soon as you've gone, <laughs> oh, he's gone now, we can take it easy. They're only doing what you want out of fear. And of course you can't always be there, you can't always maintain that presence of fear. Which means that whatever you get out of your workers, out of your family, just through that, that harshness, is only a temporary measure and in the end they, people just, they're not interested in working anymore. But when one develops compassion and kindness, you get much, much more out of the people you live with. But it has to be able to be learned and coming from the right way. And that's why that uh, we always uh, tell people to learn meditation and to be compassionate to the moment. Still people miss that point when they start meditating. They say, I can't meditate. And the reason is you're trying to meditate and that's not meditating. Try compassion, be compassionate to this moment. Whatever's happening now, your mind's all over the place, you're dull, you're tired, you're aching, be kind to that, be compassionate towards it. You know another w meaning of the word compassion is like passion with something. And when you actually look at it that way, you can understand how it works. You're passionate means you're mindful, you're engaged, you're putting effort and energy, attention into what's happening, that's what passion means. It's like when you're doing things passionately. I give my talks passionately. I give 100% into these talks. Whatever else I'm doing, I give it 100% because that's how I was taught by my teacher. Whatever you do, if you're having a cup of tea, 100%, mm, this is really nice. And if you're resting, 100%, oh, you just really rest. We were fundraising last week, 100% fundraising. Did you hear how I pronounced that? There's no D on the end of F-U-N. Fundraising, we call it. <laughs> so we raise a lot of fun. In other words, we're compassionate. It's not just getting the money which is involved, it's how it's made. We put passion into this. And when you put passion into things, you're passionate with something. It's amazing just how successful it is. So when you're doing a meditation, you're passionate with whatever's happening now. You're engaged having fun with it, uh, paying attention to it, enjoying this moment. And you can understand how, if you're compassionate to this moment, doesn't mind if, if the mind is all over the place, be passionate with that mind. Then you're making peace with it, but energetic peace with whatever's happening now. And so that's why that so often when I start meditating, you know, I'm very busy as well, you know, running around doing all sorts of things. Even when I've got nothing to do, I just sit down and do nothing and then people think, oh, he's not doing anything, I can ask him my question now. When I'm not doing anything, people think I'm free, free to, <laughs> to help you, I don't care. <laughs> because you're compassionate to the moment. When you're compassionate to the moment, you're with every moment, you're with the person in the moment, then you can communicate, you're happy, you're peaceful, you're being with things. And the whole point of meditation is learning how to be compassionate with the moment, rather than fighting against it. When you understand that, it's not fighting, it's not struggling, it's not controlling, it's not fighting a battle, it's kindness, it's gentleness, you find this way of meditation is so easy. Very, very easy. And it's not just a way of meditation, you find out this is a method in life, because when you give yourself a bit of peace, and you slow down 
and you get this wonderful sort of relaxation inside of yourself, you're giving yourself one of the greatest gifts, the gift of peace. My goodness, you all deserve that. Sometimes, you know, we think we run around all day, we've got so much business to be done. Isn't it wonderful to give yourself a gift every now and again? Once I remember teaching a meditation technique. And it's a beautiful technique because there was a time just before Christmas, a few years ago. And at Christmas is a time when people give each other presents. Also, because we have many people here from Asia, it's almost Chinese New Year. In a sort of, uh, when is it, a, a week or two's time. In Chinese New Year, you also give each other gifts. So I said, do this gift meditation. In the gift meditation, you close your eyes. It doesn't matter what your mind is, is like. Just leave it alone for a few moments just to relax. And then you imagine giving somebody a gift. And that someone is you. You imagine it like a box, like a shoe box. And you're going to give yourself the gift of peace. So imagine you've got this little box. And it's empty. And you put peace inside and then you, you, you cover it over with a lid. And you do this in your imagination. And then you get some paper, some really like gift paper. And you very carefully wrap it, because if it's a precious gift, you make sure you wrap it really, really well. And then you tie it with a ribbon, very slowly and carefully. And you get one of these little tags. And you write in your best handwriting, To me, with love from me. <laughs> And you put it aside, and really forget about it, you allow yourself to think about something, you're just pretending. And then you pretend, you find this present. You find it there, and I wonder who this is to, what's it doing there? And you look at the label. To me! Ah, oh, isn't that nice? And who's it from? For me, ah. Oh, I care about myself, isn't that wonderful? At least there's somebody in this world who loves me, and that's me. <laughs> And then just like you get any other present, you get excited when you have presents. And you don't just rip it apart. Very slowly you take off, the, untie the ribbon, unwrap the paper. And as you unwrap the paper, excitement to see what's inside. You deliberately forget what you put inside and then you open it. Peace. That's what I always wanted. Oh, thank you, me, so much. And in that little exercise, when you've just done a little bit of imagination, you'll find the psychological result of that is actually you've given yourself the gift of peace. What a wonderful gift that is. This is what we call compassion. You're being kind enough to yourself to give yourself peace. Sometimes in that box meditation, sometimes you can put all sorts of other things in that box, Sometimes I put forgiveness in that box. If I've done something, I think, oh, what did I do that for? That's a stupid thing to do. You remember, look at that box and you put lots of forgiveness in there. It doesn't matter what you imagine forgiveness to be like, just bung it in there as much as you can until you get no more in. And cover it up, wrap it up, write your name to me with love for me, hide it and then find it again, open it up slowly, and there, ah, forgiveness. That's really what I needed now. Now you can understand from this that compassion is understanding what to give to yourself and what to give to other people. I've made this point before that you know, compassion is a form of love and love is always a form of giving. And giving has got many types. You know, we give and forgive. When we're compassionate to another person, we give ourselves for something else, for a bigger purpose. And that compassion is not just for other people in the world, it's also for us. And it's a problem with human beings in our world because if only compassion goes out, it never goes in as well. If only it goes one way, not both ways, then we find that compassion never works. And that is the big problem. We have to be compassionate to ourselves, inside and also outside, to both sides of the world. The Buddha actually made that point, there's two parts to the world. He actually gave it this name, Ajatang and Bahida, internal and external. We need to balance both worlds. And so if you just give compassion to yourself, you just care about yourself, you don't care about any other person in the whole world, it doesn't work. And that's in all types of Buddhism. Selfishness is a, no part of any religion. In Buddhism we're supposed to have no self. So how can we be selfish? We have no self. It doesn't make 
sense at all. In fact, it's true, it's, it's nonsensical. But if you just give compassion outwards and never go inside, it doesn't work either. And so we make it very clear that the compassion has to go both ways. If you give yourself a moment of peace, if you give yourself a gift of peace, remember it's giving to yourself as well as to others, you will find then that you have the ability to be compassionate to other people. Too often, because we only give compassion outwards, we get grumpy, we get angry, we get upset, we become incapable of doing the right thing to others. Sometimes people think they're compassionate, they're kind, but they're not. They've got it all wrong because they've never learned how to love themselves. By loving themselves, I don't mean thinking of themselves as great human beings. What I mean is being able to give to themselves. And I mention this because this is what we can learn from the tsunami. Each one of us in this room has given a lot to the victims of the tsunami. But have you given much to yourself in the past couple of weeks? I don't mean giving yourself you know, a check you know, to me, from me. If you send that to your bag, they'll laugh, you know, drawing in your own account and putting it back in your own account. <laughs> but I don't mean a check, I mean the other things which are really important in the world, not money things, but spiritual things. So, you know, you give yourself, you know, the gifts of peace, give yourself the gift of forgiveness, give yourself the gift of acceptance, or even just a rest. Because those are very important gifts for us. The reason there is just so much turmoil in this world, so much anger and so much even cruelty, is because just people are just all stressed out. They never have any time for themselves. They're never peaceful, they're never resting. And so inside of themselves, they just, they're sick. And the only way to solve their inner sickness is just to give moments of peace, moments of stillness. I've seen that so often in the, my life as a monk. People who are stressed out, who are at their wit's end, they come to a monastery and all they need is just a few moments of peace. Remember just this person who once went to this monastery in Thailand and in that monastery in Thailand they saw a a woman come in and she was crying and she thought, sat on one of the benches in the monastery and they didn't know whether they should go and ask her what was going on, what can I help but they just left them alone. This lady cried her eyes out for over an hour, an hour and a half. Poor thing. But then afterwards when she stopped that this uh, Australian, he went up to her and asked her, what was the problem, can I help you? And she said, oh, it's okay, I feel okay now, but what happened was I lost my car keys. <laughs> because that can be very stressful for you, <laughs> it can be very upset. But she didn't really need to find her car keys, well she did, but the most important thing was to overcome her feeling of upset. And all she really needed was just a quiet place to sit down and give herself a time just to relax and see that losing her car keys is not the be all and end all of the world. Too often what happens is when we have no peace we lose perspective and small things become just so huge that sometimes we can kill ourselves, we can kill other people and certainly we kill our sense of happiness. We think it's all gone wrong, what's going to happen next? All we really need to do is to find some peace in our life just for an hour or two to get perspective. The other story was when this man came to see me at my monastery in Thailand. I was about three or four years as a monk, but I was in charge that day. He asked me, can I stay? I said, sure. He stayed for three days and he just said, can I leave now? Because I was the one who gave him permission to stay. He thought he should come and take leave of me. I said, sure. But if you don't mind me saying, why did you come here? And he said, I came here because I had an argument with my wife. I had a terrible argument, and so I ran out of the house. I didn't know where to go, so I decided to come to the temple instead. I said, can I help you with, my, you, with your wife? He said, no, no, I'm okay now. Because I just you know, relaxed I, for two or three days. I become still and peaceful. Now I've got perspective. I'm going home to my wife to say sorry. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? Instead of going to the lawyer, instead of going to the pub, <laughs> instead of going to the sort of psychiatrist, come to the temple. 
I just hang out in the temple for a couple of hours or in a couple of days if it's been a really big argument and you calm down <laughs> when you calm down you get perspective and in that piece you think wow such a small thing we argue on why am I going to sort of wreck this marriage this wonderful person I really love them and I live with them so long and they're such a great person why am I going to wreck this marriage over a small thing I'm just going to go back and say sorry and I love you and let's make up and this is what happens when you give yourself some peace. In that peace you get perspective. And all of those really, really big things which you think are just life-threatening or relationship-threatening, they all fall into perspective. They're not such a big deal anymore. I think I, I'm not sure when I told this last story, but it just comes to my mind now. Have I always noticed in a monastery the time when we have arguments? So this is the, in our monastery back in Thailand because we don't seem to have that many arguments in my monastery. At least not when I'm there. Maybe they argue when I go away, <laughs> but not when I'm there. <laughs> but I always notice in this monastery people have arguments on one day every week, and it was the day after the monks would stay up all night meditating. In the forest tradition of northeast Thailand, under Ajahn Chah, once a week we'd forego our sleep and spend all night sitting meditation and doing some walking meditation. It was on the moon nights, the Poya days, the one prayer in Thai. And it was always the day after when there was arguments in the monastery. And it didn't take me long to understand why. Because I used to almost get into arguments. I remember one evening I was, you know, because my meditation wasn't all that good at the time, that was the reason why, now I know that. But at the time, instead of like, you know, thinking it was my fault, I saw all these other monks sneaking back to have a sleep, having a cup of tea and coffee when they weren't supposed to, you know, slacking off. And I thought, they can't do that. And I thought, I'm going to sort of go and tell them off. After you know, we finished, I'm going to go to their huts and just tell them what for. They can't do this, this is wrong, it's against the rules of the monastery, you shouldn't do this. But of course I realized that that would just create arguments. I've seen many arguments happening because of that. So I decided this one time, and this really showed me just how, the, the, how peace can solve conflicts. I wrote all those complaints down on a piece of paper because I didn't want to forget them. They were important. I decided to have a sleep first of all. And then I would go and tell those monks what for. So I wrote it all down on a piece of paper, I put it down by you know, the, my mat where we used to sleep in the huts. I had a nice sleep because after staying up all night, meditating all night, we were allowed to have a sleep just after our meal. And I had a nice sleep, two or three hours. And when I woke up afterwards, I looked at that piece of paper and I thought, this is just small stuff, it's petty stuff. Do I really want to have an argument with my friends because of this? It was amazing, the perspective changed just after I had a rest. And I learnt a lot from that experience. I realised that most arguments would never happen if you have a bit of a rest, physically and mentally, make yourself peaceful and calm. And then you look, why do we have a war in our family over these small things? Why do we have a war in our world? Most of the wars in the world are over small things weapons of mass destruction, there weren't any. <laughs> There's some tiny little things and why do we have these big wars? We create so much trouble. Why do we have wars in our family? The arguments we have with our loved ones. Why do we have wars between religions, for goodness sake? So when we give ourselves some peace, you, know, you find that you are less aggressive, less grumpy, less angry, you can be more kind to other people. You can give them more space. You can be more compassionate. Now do you get the point of why I've been talking in this way for the last five minutes? If you give yourself some compassion, that's the way you give compassion to others. Give yourself the gift of peace, the gift of forgiveness. And when you feel calm, you feel good, you feel happy, what are you going to give to other people? You're going to treat them with peace, with happiness, with kindness as well. So I'd love to get all the leaders of the world to come and do a meditation retreat in my monastery for a few weeks. I'll invite Mr. Bush, Mr. Blair, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> invite them all to come along. 
And when they were peaceful and calm and having a good time, and then I don't think <laughs> there could be any wars at all. Because you can't, if you give yourself that peace, that forgiveness, then what you have to give to the world is only peace and kindness as well. So that compassion always has to go both ways. Remember some years ago, there was, I think there was some, I think it was the student riots in Burma, where many students got killed by the military government. And a few of the Burmese Buddhists here in Perth wanted to do something, some sort of demonstration or some sort of action to actually to bring some more consciousness to what was happening in that country at the time. So they decided to have a meditation sit-in opposite Hay Street Mall. I think it was on the steps of the I think Uniting Church or Methodist Church, I forget which one it was. The Wesley Church, that's what it was, on the steps there. And they invited me to come along to actually, to, they, because we were all meditating on the steps throughout the day, from early in the morning until late at, late at night. And I did a two hour meditation there on the steps and opposite the, the Hay Street Mall. And as I was just coming out of my meditation, I, I always remember this. This man walked past. And he sort of looked at us just sitting there. He realized it was because of some sort of political problem in Burma. And I remember he saying, that'll do a lot of bloody good, wouldn't it? <laughs> they're just sitting there. But I thought afterwards, no sir, you're wrong. This is doing a lot of bloody good, if you like. Because it was actually teaching by example. It's doing a huge amount of good. Because it's actually, if you give yourself that peace, you can actually react to those problems in the world in a peaceful way. Whenever you're in conflict, if you have conflict in your office, go and sit meditation five minutes beforehand. You've got to go and sort out that conflict. Don't go thinking about it. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? How am I going to deal with that problem? Give yourself a few moments of peace first of all. If you're going to give peace to others, give it to yourself first. Give yourself that compassion. And I will guarantee if you give yourself five minutes of real peace, real compassion, and you go into that hot house of what could be an aggressive situation, you will find something happens. Something beautiful happens. Oh, was it? I forget who this was. There was one of the ladies. I'm not sure if it was from here, off of Singapore, Malaysia. I travel around so much. They went. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was this um, a lady from Sydney. <laughs> None of those places. One of the disciples from Sydney. She was in uh, marketing, PR, and so mostly she goes to London, Sydney, and New York. She's actually helping market my book. But she said that she had to go to this meeting, this high-profile meeting in London. And she just uh, just uh, talked to her about my book when I was in Sydney. And so she flew all that way. She was jet lagged and she had this meeting with this very, very tough boss. And uh, when she got to the, the uh, boardroom, all the other directors in this very big company just said, you better look out, he's in a bad mood today. And so she took my advice. She made her mind peaceful and kind and calm had a bit of compassion for herself first of all. And then she said it was amazing. When the boss came in, he just came straight out of her. She said, oh, you've got such beautiful blue eyes. You remind me of my, my daughter. And you know, she's got a young daughter back in Sydney uh, who's just, uh, uh, her name is Holly. And um, actually I called her Suwana. I gave her a Buddhist name. Suwana means like, like gold. And she said the, the boss just melted immediately. And they, they talked about their contract, no arguments at all. Everything went really, really well. And all the other directors afterwards would say, how do you do that? Teach us that. <laughs> because she managed to calm that boss down immediately and get a proper conversation when all the other directors thought that was actually impossible. That was almost like a psychic power. And all it came from is giving herself a bit of peace and kindness before she had that meeting. And when I saw her again, she said, you wouldn't believe this, and this is what happened. And it amazed her. It just showed the power of kindness, compassion, peace towards oneself. 
Give it to yourself first of all, and it will go out to others afterwards. So if you want to spread more kindness and peace in this world, please start with yourself. If you don't give yourself peace and kindness, you will find you will never be able to react in a proper way. And you'll find that you, little things will become magnified out of all proportions. You won't be able to remain calm and still because you've got no calm and stillness inside of you. You don't know what calm and stillness is. You haven't got this foundation of peace inside. Which is why that really encourage people to learn meditation, encourage people to learn compassion, which is exactly the same thing, in, encourage people to give themselves some peace, to forgiveness, some stillness. And once you know what that really means, it's so wonderful in the world. You can give kindness, peace, compassion to anybody. It's just so often that, oh, just uh, when we were fighting the clay truck business, I remember going, because one of our local members in Armadale was Alana Watinian. We went into office a couple of times. The last time, you know, this was when she was in opposition, the last time we came out of the office, you know, she was the last uh, client of the day, so she took us to the door afterwards and she said, you know, it's so nice to get a couple of, c of calm people in my office. I remember those, that, that because a politician is very, very rare to actually to meet calm people or quiet people. <laughs> it's either media or problems and there's always people arguing about you. And just she appreciated just quiet people in her office. You know, a short time ago, a year or two ago, I had to go into the flight center to do my travel arrangements, and that's over in Mirabuka uh, shopping mall. I was actually there this afternoon picking up a ticket. As I call it like a monk hanging out in the mall. <laughs> well, I don't hang out. They just go in and go out very quickly. But one of the monks with me that time, he just sat down on a chair waiting for me while I was waiting to be served, and he just sat meditation. And just the, the uh, person behind the counter just looked at him and said, Oh... I wish I could do that. <laughs> it just people really appreciate peace and kindness, a uh, peace and calmness. And if you can just be peaceful and calm and just do that much, you can give so much to other people in this world. Just having a calm, peaceful influence in the office, in the mall or anywhere, people really appreciate it. It used to be the tradition in Thailand, still is in many places, that the monks would go on arms round every morning. And one of the wonderful things about that arms round is every village in those days, the first thing they would see, or one of the first things they see when they woke up in the morning is this line of peaceful beings just walking into their village, not speaking, walking slowly, mindful, just taking a bit of rice from whoever had a bit that morning. At first I thought we were begging. Now I realize we were giving. Imagine if you saw that every morning, one of the first things you saw, a line of monks or nuns just passing by your house, peaceful, calm, not really concerned about the things in the world, just being silent. What a wonderful gift that is to our neighborhoods. People who are angry would calm down. People who were desperate would find some solace. Because just even the sight of peacefulness it sort of resonates with something inside. We remember what peace, what kindness is really all about. So being compassionate to yourself means giving yourself peace, giving yourself forgiveness, giving yourself just a few moments. And then it leads to compassion for others. So when we're giving, we're trying to find something to do for the tsunami victims, maybe one of the great things you can do if you haven't done it yet, gives yourself a gift of a retreat. We're having a nine-day retreat soon. Do it for the tsunami victims. If you can't do it, do it for the tsunami victims, a whole nine-day retreat, do a weekend retreat for all the victims of oppression, all the people who are having sorrow and trouble and pain in the world. If you can't do a weekend retreat, just learn a little bit of meditation on a Saturday afternoon. And if you think that's going to do a lot of good, I was going to say that word again, but I shouldn't. It is doing a lot of good because you are creating the causes within yourself by just taking time out and being peaceful. To be someone who doesn't add to the troubles in the world, 
but someone who can calm those troubles. You can actually learn those wonderful skills, those conflict resolution skills by first of all learning how to solve that conflict within yourself. What is meditation anyway? You've got a conflict within yourself when you start meditating. You want peace, you're not at peace. You want to be still, the mind is all over the place. How are you going to solve that conflict? Letting go, being at peace, it doesn't matter. Allow things to be. Be compassionate, be kind. You don't try and change the world. You allow the world to be. You make peace with the world. You don't think the world is going to make peace with you. You let go of craving and control. You allow things to be. You're compassionate. The door of my heart is open to this moment. If you can do that with your meditation, with every moment, you'll find peace comes inside of yourself. It's like a microcosm. It's like an example. As within, so without. If that's how you meditate for yourself, you can solve the conflict inside your own meditation. You'll understand how to solve the conflict out there in the world. So by giving yourself a few moments of peace in a meditation or meditation retreat, you're equipping yourself to solve the conflicts in your home, in your office, or out there in the world. As one of the disciples who, in our South of the River group, she used to be the, the deputy principal of Rolling Stone Primary School. She used to teach meditation to her year, year sixes, year after year after year, for many years. She's retired now. But I remember visiting that school a couple of times and going to have tea with the principal. And he said, look, I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I really respect that lady and I really respect what you're doing. Because he said it was amazing just how that meditation on year six is, how it's working. He said, I've been, I know year sixes, I've been in this uh, school, in the, the education system for such a long time. And when this lady taught meditation, she started off with, she called it quiet time, so other religions wouldn't be really upset. She called it quiet time. She started off with five minutes in the morning. And through by the end of the, the year, the school year, she was up to about 15 or 20 minutes. The children loved it. In fact, they always looked forward to it. And amazing things happened. When these children had just a few minutes of peace in the morning, remember they were in the playground, coming, home, coming from home, rushing around to actually to get there. As soon as you're in school, or the assembly or whatever is finished, then 15 minutes of quietness. The principal saw that those kids, their ability to concentrate rose, the ability to assimilate information rose, the academic performance increased enormously, but the most interesting part of this was some of the other results of doing this quiet time. Whenever there was a conflict in the classroom, one of the children would automatically put up their hand and say, Miss, can we have quiet time now? And everybody would just sit there, close their eyes and meditate for five minutes. And that solved the conflict. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when you were having an argument at home, that no matter who it was, the wife or the husband, say, can we have quiet time now? And the both of you just shut up, sat down and meditate for five minutes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if that happened in Parliament? The speaker said, okay, quiet time. And, and Mr. I don't know, is, Mr. is it Mr. Beasley or Mr. Latham? I haven't seen the newspaper. It's Beasley, is it? As of today, Mr. Beasley and Mr. Howard and whoever else is there. Okay, no argument. They sit down and meditate for five minutes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? They get much more done because their mind will be in a good state. It will be compassionate working together. That was what happened in the year sixes. But also they found, and I think it's... Is Parliament, is it above or below year, grade six? I'm not, quite <laughs> I'm not quite sure about that. But no, I shouldn't say things like that. But you find actually that if you give yourself moments of peace, this is the other thing they found, sorry, the other thing they found in the school, which the principal told me, he said, the other strange thing was that this particular class, or this class every year, there's a couple of year sixes in the school, this particular class who did this quiet time, he noticed that the children in that school were more kind to each other and more sensitive to each other's needs. 
Whenever any child was upset or something was troubling them, the other children would come around. He saw this was a very strange result of this quiet time. People were actually more kind, caring, more cooperative, more able to work together. Why is it that we find it hard to work together? Why is it in companies there's always so many splits? In families, we find it hard to maintain a relationship? I'll tell you why, because we don't spend enough time being quiet, too stressed out. All the grumpiness, the argument, the negativity, the fault finding, it's all coming because we don't have compassion for ourselves just to be peaceful for a while. You know this, when people who've been on retreat, they come back after retreat, they're so much easier to live with. So many parents have come to meditation because they've been sent by their children. Mummy, you must go. Daddy, go to meditation. You're such an awful daddy when you don't go to meditation. The kids know that. So you can understand what it does. If you give yourself moments of peace, forgiveness, whatever, that's the most compassionate thing you can do for others, let alone for yourself. As for me, just meditating just for a few minutes, I feel so happy, so at peace, and I find I can work more afterwards. It's compassionate to give yourself some time out. So when we're talking about compassion, we're not saying, right, you go out there in the world, you go to Archer, you go to, to Sri Lanka, you really work hard, stop being lazy, don't think about yourself, sacrifice your life for others. That's not how it works. You just create more problems in the world that way. Because you haven't got the ability to help. You tend up to become part of the problem rather than solving the problem. Too much out there, you create more difficulties in the world, more arguments. You've, you've seen people like that, I've seen people like that. You need to give to yourself and then to give to others. Compassion for yourself, compassion for others. And I know that because that's a path of Buddhism. You spend your first years just being alone in the forests. You're being compassionate to the moment first of all until you become peace with now. Full passion with this. So you're completely with this moment. Energized, passionate, enjoying every moment. You're compassionate towards the silence. Too many people are afraid of the quietness of the mind. That's why they can't remain quiet. They disturb the silence. What is it that person said? If you can't improve upon the silence, then be quiet. What a beautiful saying. If you can't improve upon this silence, shh. Silence is beautiful when you get to know it. And so when you are passionate about silence, you find you don't talk so much. Because silence is important, it's wonderful. You just see how we've lost the passion for silence in the world? It's so hard to find a quiet place, even in the house. And if you're passionate about watching your breath, not just breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, beautiful breath. That's why I call it the beautiful breath, because when I watch my breath, I'm passionate about my breath. Mm, this is marvelous. This is lovely. And that's when you're passionate with something. That's when you get so peaceful. You're giving your energy to this, to this breath, to this moment. And that's why you get into really deep meditations. You're giving passion to this peaceful moment and the peace obviously grows. Whatever you're passionate about, it's easier to pay attention to. I don't know what you're passionate about. People think, oh, Ajahn Brahm has got no passion anymore. He's been a monk for such a long time. But no, I'm passionate about my meditation. <laughs> you're compassionate to it. And you get so much peace inside and that peace gives you energy. It gives you joy and happiness. And that means you can really work hard for other people. That's why I do end up going around all over the place working hard and helping and serving and making a difference. So to be kind to other people, to really work hard for other people, to do something in this world, to learn how to solve the problems of tragedies, 
big tragedies, medium tragedies, small tragedies in the world. There's going to be another tsunami, if not a tsun another tsunami, another war, another earthquake, another something or other. You know that tragedies keep on coming. We have lulls, periods when things go well in the world. And then we have a, a crisis, whether that's in the world or whether that's in your life or your family or your monastery. You know there's always another crisis coming, just we don't know when. So in order to prepare for those crises, to learn from it, to learn what to do next, how about giving yourself some peace? So you can learn compassion, you can learn that power. The story of the Buddha, as many of you know, for years he just was by himself in the forests, learning peace, learning stillness learning how to communicate that stillness and peace with others. And after his enlightenment, then he could really work hard for the sake of all beings. And that's why there's a whole big religion called Buddhism. You have to learn compassion coming from peace. Some years ago, I gave a talk at St Hilda's, the Anglican Girls' School. And after the, <laughs> after the talk, at the school, we had um, tea with the headmaster, head, no, the, the headmistress. I actually called him headmistress, not principal in those days. Had tea with her. And then we were talking about religion, because she was actually a devout Anglican. We talked about, like, love. She said, love comes from God. I said, no, no, love comes from peace. And we had this great argument about where love comes from. And I think I won that, and I still stand by what I say. Because it's from peacefulness and calmness. That's where you get love from. That's my experience anyway. Because have you ever seen people who aren't peaceful, can they give love and compassion? Oh, not at all. If it comes from God, sometimes they just want to convert you and that's not peace at all. That's just harshness. I don't know if I when I last told this story. I think I told it over in Singapore. That Remember those first years as uh, in my monastery in, in Serpentine? The first years in Serpentine, 21 years ago, when we you know, had a, a quite a bit of building material in the monastery, but we had no security system. It was just like a wire fence all around the property, and much of that was rusted through, and people could come and go. Actually, the first few months there, because I was teaching over in uh, Carnot Prison Farm, that the people in my meditation group, they wanted to actually come and give a hand and uh, do something, do some, some work for us, because we'd be helping them, they wanted to help us. So we had all these loop-ins, and we got about six or seven of the, uh, the prisoners to come over and just do some weeding. And I was with them, and they're supposed to have these two guards looking after them, but they were just sitting over there, just meditating, I suppose, but they weren't looking after the guards. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the prisoners called out to me, hey, look at this. And what was it? And it was actually it was about three or four uh, marijuana plants going our monastery the first years. Uh, and what actually happened is that some sort of jojo, instead of actually growing marijuana in their own yard, they thought there's no one living in this place, so they put it in our property. And the idea was if it's somebody else's property, and no one was there, they could actually go and get it, when it harvest it when it was ready. And I told these prisoners, oh, you better sort of take that out. I said, oh, do we have to? They told me. <laughs> said, please, yeah, no, do we really have to? They said, it really hurt, but they did it because they respected me. But to actually to keep like sort of you know, uh, people away from the monastery, I was told actually to put a sign up there, you know, trespassers will be prosecuted. And I told Ajahn Jakaro at the time, I said, that won't work. It doesn't matter who people go in. So we changed the sign to trespassers will be converted. <laughs> <laughs> and that worked. <laughs> Trouble was, somebody stole my sign. <laughs> it is a bit... <laughs> Really good sign. Cause it's true, isn't it? If you say trespassers will be converted, then no one will go in there. <laughs> but anyway, that's not kind trying to convert somebody else. So, and if it comes from sometimes a God, sometimes it's not really kindness and compassion at all. Sometimes it's too much aggression, changing other people. But it comes from peace, from silence. And that's where compassion comes from. You try that out. Sometimes you get so still. I, I remember one of the 
the first time I got into a really deep meditation, just so still, amazingly still. If you get into this meditation business, you get so much happiness. You get so peaceful and so still, nothing is moving. That's a wonderful state to be in. But when you came out afterwards, the first thing I wanted to do was to get this teacher who taught me meditation and just go and kiss his feet. Whatever, you just you had so much joy afterwards. You just wanted to go and do something for other people. Certainly, my experience is the more peaceful you, peace you have, the more compassion you have. And to me, it's quite obvious that real compassion, real love, comes from a peaceful mind. It was because someone like the Buddha was absolutely peaceful. That's why he was so compassionate. That's where it comes from. The silence within, the stillness, when you get the perspective. You've given yourself the gift of peace, the gift of Dhamma. Then you can go and give that out to other people. Not only can you give compassion out, but you can know what compassion truly is. And you understand, converting other people, that's not being compassionate, that's just being stupid. Or just you know, going and giving people material things. Okay, they need food, they need a house, yeah. But they need much more than that. Sometimes just friendship. You actually know the right thing to do. Even to the point when you are in any situation which you have not been prepared for, and you've got to act compassionately. The only thing you can do is to shut up and be quiet and listen. There was one of the doctors, I don't know if he's here this evening, he still comes along. When he came up to me once, he was in turn at one of the, I think it was at Royal Perth, his pager went, one of his patients had a cardiac arrest, rushed to the bedside, resuscitated the person, but not quick enough. He was brain damaged. If he'd have waited a few minutes later, he would have been dead. And he thought, why couldn't I wait? Because I've now my patient is in the prison of his body, would have no quality of life for probably many years. He felt so guilty about what he did. And so he came to me with this question, what should I do next time my pager comes off, goes off? Should I let the person die? Should I try and resuscitate them? Because I don't want to do this again. So, you know, to confine a person to being halfway between life and death, which is what this person was. And I told him, look, to be compassionate, to be wise, next time that happens, rush to the bedside, spend a couple of seconds being quiet. As still and silent as you possibly can. And from that place of silence, listen. And you know what to do. Because that's how, how I've been taught, and that's how I've been practicing. My compassion comes from silence. And that, where the wisdom comes as well. I was never trained in psychology, in counselling, and how to deal with crazy people. And be many crazy people I've met in my life. Sometimes very dangerously crazy. I could have been hurt many, many times. And how, what's my training for that? I just make my mind silent and peaceful. As quiet as I possibly can. And feel what needs to be done. My compassion comes from silence and it saved me. It protected me for so many years. And now I'm very confident, whatever I go, whoever I meet, you can always know what to do. Quietness. Shh. And in that peace, you know the answers. And in that peace, you have the energy to be compassionate. In that peace, you have the passion for the moment. In the passion for the moment, you can truly listen and you can care for somebody else. So, when I talk about compassion and meditation, serving in the world, serving in silence, they are exactly the same. Bodhisattva path, Arahat path, People who only read books think they're different. People who know meditation understand they are one and the same. Peace is love. Stillness is compassion. Compassion is stillness. If we could only build more stillness in the world, we'd have more compassion. What a wonderful world that would be. Thank you. Very good, I've got one person clapping. Ah, oh, so kind of you. And she clapped from stillness.
Okay, any questions about this evening's talk? You're so compassionate <laughs> because you're so peaceful. Okay, thanks very much. We just have some announcements now. If you have any questions, you can always come up and ask them personally afterwards. But now we have the announcements from our President Saul.